Britain's King Charles III gave his speech to, to open Parliament uh, not long ago, lining out Labour's first program for government in 14 years. The King's speech coming after the centre-left Labour won a big majority in the national election earlier this month. Let's listen to what the King had to say. Securing economic growth will be a fundamental mission. My government will seek a new partnership with both business and working people and help the country move on from the recent cost of living challenges by prioritizing wealth creation for all communities. My ministers will establish an industrial strategy council. It is my government's objective to see rising living standards in all nations and regions in the United Kingdom. Victoria Honeyman is a professor of British politics at the University of Leeds, and she joins us now from there for more analysis on the King's speech. Uh, what were your thoughts here? I mean, here we heard the King just a moment ago speaking about how they want to secure economic growth, they want to provide more wealth creation. How exactly is Labour going to do just that? There weren't many surprises. We we knew pretty much most of what was going to be in the, the King's speech because it's the kind of things that were talked about during the election and it was the things that the Labour Party was talking about even before the election. The point of the King's speech is to not only lay out what legislation they want but also to give a direction of travel. Now, the, the issues that they focused on with the economy are very, very difficult. Issues relating to productivity, issues relating to wealth creation, these are not easy to solve. And we saw some of the bills that they're suggesting might go some way to do it. So, for example, the creation of GB Energy, the renationalisation of um, the rail structures, for example, issues relating to renters' rights, the things that will affect people's lives right across the social spectrum. We know that they're expected to bring in um, or remove, I should say, the, the tax break that private schools get. So they're looking at this in a variety of ways, but none of them are easy fixes that are going to work immediately. Were there any surprises for you in this speech or did everything seem pretty true to what Labour had campaigned on? Everything seemed pretty true. There were a couple of bills that were mentioned that are continuations of, of things that were suggested by the Conservative government previously. So, for example, issues relating to um, the, um, uh, the ability of individuals to buy cigarettes, for example. Um, there were a few things that, that might have been included that haven't as yet. Um, so, for example, issues relating to votes for 16-year-olds. For but I don't doubt that they will come along in time. There's only so much that can be achieved in any parliamentary uh, term. So no, no big surprises. It was interesting. There was a lot of focus domestically, of course, but also a lot of focus uh, internationally uh, showing that this government definitely wants to give its support to Ukraine, reset relations with the EU. It's all behind a two-state solution for, for the Middle East. Again, will Labour be more successful in, in those projects? They probably will be more successful in some of those projects, such as their relations with the EU, because that's actually relatively new. The idea that, that the, the previous government had was that they were, or I should say the style that the previous government had was that they were slightly combative with other members of the EU. The idea that, that the government would be more collegiate with the EU, would treat them as friends, is a, is a step change that we're seeing. And um, so I, they'll probably be more successful in, in that regard because relations tend to work better when you have good relations rather than when you have poor relations. The key thing that the Labour Party, the Labour government now will want to do is to make sure that their foreign policy is viewed as being as robust as that of the Conservative Party. It's a very traditional attack line of the Conservative Party to say that Labour is weak on security, weak on foreign policy. So this support for Ukraine and um, pushing the kind of very traditional elements of foreign policy, we've heard talk about how they're going to, to restructure um, uh, different elements of the military or increase military spending. This will be key to essentially defending themselves against those kind of criticisms. Indeed. And it's interesting what you're saying about uh, Labour being perceived as being weak on security because there were definite comments to strengthen borders, up the police, a presence, a curb immigration crime, things like that. Yeah, the, the more domestic elements of foreign policy are things that Labour has been criticised for and that they conversely criticised the Conservative government for. So if you take immigration, for example, they argued that the previous government's 
policy of um, deporting illegal immigrants to Rwanda was completely ineffective. What you actually needed was to try and stop those individuals and um, before they even got to the United Kingdom and to try and deal with some of those issues, such as, for example, policing of the channel, relationships with the French for, uh, government, for example, and also issues relating to how you can actually create more legal routes for people so that they're not forced into incredibly dangerous crossings across the English Channel. So all of those kind of things are, will be focused on by the Labour government because they criticise the Conservatives for not doing those things, and they will want to see those things done in an attempt to reduce illegal immigration numbers and immigration numbers generally. It was interesting. We saw so much of the pomp and circumstance and ceremony that's so much part of the British heritage in this speech. It has to be, I can't even imagine what goes through King Charles's mind when he's reading about modernizing the House of Lords, uh, axing <laughs> hereditary lawmakers. I mean, it, it's it's a bit incongruous at times. The the British system is is full of pomp and ceremony as well as more practical elements to it. And the two are very much bound up. The job, of, and it is a job of, of King Charles in this event, is to read out with absolutely no emotion, as little emotion as possible, what his government is going to do because he isn't allowed to express a political viewpoint on it. So his job is to essentially sit in all of his regalia in a kind of monotone reading out what his government's going to do so that there is no hint of whether or not he agrees with it. So it's a very big day for him as king. He's, he did it previously when he was the Prince of Wales, when required when his mother was perhaps not, not um, fit enough to, to perform it. So he's not new to this, but this is nonetheless a, a new government and they want to make their mark. And it's King Charles's job to read it out in as completely unemotional way as he possibly can. Which he certainly did. OK, Victoria Honeyman, thanks so much for taking the time to speak <laughs> to us. You. you are a professor of British politics at the University of Leeds. Thank you.